Hi there, welcome to the Non-Servian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald. My not present guest, but internet present guest, is my friend Corey Massimino, who's a philosophy student and writer. He often organizes things like virtual reading groups and discussion symposiums that are a lot of the time about anarchism. Um, he's a fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society. His writings can be found around the internet in a lot of places, like I remember The Guardian and antiwar.com, and I know there are others, but he told me he's a man of mysteries, so what are you going to do? Um, but his Twitter is at Corey Massimino, so give him a follow. That was the best introduction I've ever had. Thank you so much, Lucy. Podcasting with you has given me like strong 2015 vibes. I Which, think 2015? Something like that. Um, it, it, it takes us back to our innocent youth, both our innocent youth and the innocent youth of libertarian anarchism, I guess, because whenever I talk to um, anarchist friends now, there's always somebody to kind of sadly shit talk or rant about, generally just worry about the state of uh, individualism. I think everything was more innocent in 2015, including myself. I mean, yeah, I don't know about innocent, but it's just like, and I don't go for nostalgia glasses, but Trump then COVID, shit got wacky. You don't have nostalgia glasses for the early 2010s? I think that's a lie. Um, Any reasonable person sort of. that was alive <laughs> then has... I mean, I was doing more stuff, I guess, and some of it was fun. Um, the world was doing, well, <laughs> some ways. So we just miss Obama, I guess. Mainstream Democrat. No, I don't want to phrase it like that. Ugh. Yeah. But I'm getting weird stuff from libertarian anarchist etc circles about ukraine and i don't know if you're seeing this also where you get a lot of like wait wait you're getting weird stuff from libertarian <laughs> anarchist circles yeah no no Oof. doubt what yeah. a time i know uh, that is that is not new that is not new but people are weird about ukraine and to me everybody sounds like ron paul at his worst about his best subject, which was always anti-war stuff, where you kind of talk about you're so you're so nervous about the idea of the U.S. intervening that you start talking about dictators and about other countries intervening in other countries that you start to sound like, well, that's, you know, that's just a peaceful activity intervening in other countries. Um, and I feel like that's the way people are, uh, people are talking about Putin kind of weirdly right now. They're talking about Ukraine being full of Nazis right now. Yeah, it's interesting. This this always was um, prominent with Rothbard too. This, I mean, it's it's kind of ironic because the thing that makes certain thinkers most reliably anti-war in many or most contexts also leads them to downplay non-American wars in this case by Russia and Putin and. That's a interesting failure mode that I think we're seeing a lot. It's hard More to have a nuanced than ever, opinion on Ukraine. It's hard like, to have a nuanced opinion on it um, because the discourse is very sectarian on it, and um, yeah, it's it's not ideal. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I think the whole worrying about nuclear annihilation thing that's a that's a that's a retro throwback for the kids in terms of um the cold war being back and stuff but like yeah i love retro stuff <laughs> just... no that's i mean i think that um the i mean that's what um even those who i think are downplaying the badness of the military invasion of Ukraine get right as compared to a lot of more mainstream liberals, which is like, no, like there's a threat that all of humanity could die. That's not to be taken lightly. It's absolutely insane the way some people are talking about um, accounting for that risk and also taking steps like no fly zones that would make that risk much, much more likely. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure it's good to see at least some people, you know, that that should be a primary concern. Yeah, I'm not sure some people even know what no-fly zones actually entail. It just sounds kind of good, you know? It sounds vaguely defensive and, like, we'll protect Ukrainians, so... Yes, I it's that, I, I, that term itself seems uh, 
fraught with with misunderstanding and ambiguity like um i wonder if intentionally but yeah i mean <laughs> how many violent things are are not directly called that i mean that's a whole libertarian rant to go down is that pretending stuff isn't violent um yeah i mean i mean if the polls i think the based on because there were those i'm sure you've seen those polls that seem to say that support for no fly zone was like startlingly high and like 70 percent. i thought i saw but, yeah. but i think i saw other things that suggested that when you ask the question in a more uh direct way like would you support the u.s adopting a policy of itself shooting down russian planes uh in this area you know then the support goes down i think when it's like explained to be a, a, right. the, a direct confrontational action that it is which is totally reasonable i mean there's no need nice. to like, trick people in polling like those pollsters. <laughs> um, do you think that I, I, this is, I can't at all quantify, but like, it feels like everybody's more like paleo now, like Tucker Carlson's the king of, uh, of TV Late news. Night yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, um, what a world. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he, he's, he's, he's pulling a, Oh, we shouldn't go to war. We should just bring the troops to the Mexican border thing that like, it's impossible to like enthusiastically support that, but like, I don't know. Do you think any of that's doing any good? Like, I I would argue that that the Donald Trump was a kind of a paleo too, and like, I don't, I don't think that's helped like the cause of liberty at all. Well, it is interesting how I mean, it seems like, um, in this case, uh, the direction in the last few years of conservatism has has kind of led to a switching of the sides because I see way more kind of call for escalation and even just like outright xenophobia. And I guess we can maybe get into what counts as that in terms of um, policies and trade and things like that. But but from the left and from really from liberals. Um, and so it seems like for uh, whatever reason, the uh, if, a few people on the right, their instincts are at least right on the like, well, this isn't a, a good opportunity for U S in, uh, in, intervention. Um, that seems to come along with like the most loathsome apologetics for Putin and the military invasion of Ukraine. So it's annoying. Again, you can't really have a nuanced opinion on this, but. Well, I mean, you just did and you had the correct. Well, I can't, I said, <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Other I can't, you, I'm you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I don't even know how much good I think, like, this this sort of mindset about intervention is doing. Because, yeah, okay, the neocons are, are, are unpopular again, though I'm sure they're rubbing their hands together excitedly about Ukraine and the possibility for more interventions. But, like, I don't know, man. Like, I remember a couple of years ago when... Richard Spencer and Ann Coulter, but specifically Richard Spencer, were upset about Trump for bombing Syria. And it's like, those people are not your anarchist uh, fellows in any way. So, like, I'm never even sure what to do with that, that quote-unquote anti-war sentiment coming from the weirdest circles like that. Well, yeah, I mean, well, the political spectrum has always been kind of weird uh you know in all sorts of unpredictable ways so you 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 have the reverse as well of um people on the on the left uh you know maybe being consistently good on um you know things like american imperialism and american intervention and then engaging in those same exact apologetics for yeah some in this case, Russia, even I mean, more reliably, more uh, you know, overly Marxist-Leninist states like China. Right. So, but even Russia in this case, which is kind of like hilarious to see fracturing among leftists, with some of them taking that line and seeing even Russia as the poor little victim um, compared to you know uh, what they what they count as hegemony. Um, it, it's. Uh, it's it's a bit strange to see the left fracturing or that, but it's also I mean I, I it there's there's a weird a weird tendency where anarcho communists are almost weirdly better on this stuff and have more nuanced opinions on this stuff than 
um, right libertarians and especially paleo libertarians. I think in part because of the anarcho communists, their in group proximity to outright tankies. And so they're seeing that stuff in those lines and those okay. apologetics for non American dictators and authoritarian regimes a lot more uh, closely and often. And so they have more of an incentive really to obviously dissociate themselves from that, to argue against it, to signal against that. Whereas paleo libertarians and right libertarians barely ever interact, obviously, with really uh, overt uh, Marxist Leninists and, and, and authoritarians um, uh, of that stripe. So it almost feels like they will just kind of hook, line, and sinker repeat stuff that that is ultimately apologetics for stuff that they would oppose if the American government was doing it. Yeah, I mean, I have seen some, some paleo-style stuff that is downright tanky-esque. Um, and in general, I think I'm a little bit over pointing out hypocrisy as like a political, but 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 it's hypocritical. Yeah, obviously the U.S. government is hypocritical every second of every day. Um, I don't want it, nobody sane or lacking literal amnesia wants to hear from George W. Bush or Condoleezza Rice about how horrible it is to invade a sovereign nation. But like, not to quote my own tweet, but like. I tried to get this across recently where it's like, okay, you know, the worst people in the world sometimes have pointed out U.S. hypocrisy, including, you know, like Timothy McVeigh, um, oh, yeah. Vladimir Putin, just like people that suck, obviously. If you have any sure. principle beyond, well, that's hypocritical. I mean, I just, I don't know. It's not, it's not philosophically like deep in the slightest. And yeah, well, it's, it's obvious that rival you know, governments, rival uh, uh, imperialist powers would um, point out the hypocrisy of other imperialist powers that they are caught up in a zero-sum conflict with. Right. Um, and so it's really uh, hard to, I mean, in some ways to kind of avoid that altogether, um, or at least you got to be on your toes to just like, it's really easy to, I think, be trying to identify some evil or talk about some evil and then like unwittingly slip into um, like, 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 a, like, a, like a morally inaccurate vision of what's going on. Um, but, I mean, uh, I mean, you said no one, uh, you said neoconservatives are really unpopular now, but unfortunately, that, I, don't, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. They're just unpopular amongst conservatives. Oh, which, that's, that's a good point, good, actually. But like, that's you a, know, yeah, of course. Even during Trump, before all of this, even during Trump, we were lamenting the rehabilitation of George uh, W. Bush um, among liberals. And that's like the case now. So it's weird because like neoliberalism, it feels, has like overtaken neoconservative. Like there, there's a real convergence there um, with, with seeing a huge active role for American interventionism in the world. Um, regardless of what domestic policies they like pair with that view. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, my college, um, whose emails I still get, like for God knows reason, what reason I got an email. It's like, Oh, we're having an online event with, um, uh, Lynn Cheney. And I was like, my <laughs> random, tiny, stupid, like liberal arts, liberal college is we're going to bring, we're going to bring her. In. That's how it, it that's how it that's is. Now. Did you go? No. Uh, <laughs> if I go in person, I, I you know, do, throw tomatoes or something. I don't know. Do whatever yeah, you're supposed tomatoes. to do. <laughs> That'll stop the war. Yeah, no, I know. Just wasn't enough tomatoes circa 2003. <laughs> this was in 2003? No, <laughs> exactly. It oh, was, oh, I see. I'm sorry. It I was last so, week. I wildly misunderstood what that comment meant. Sorry, that was. I was not. No, I mean, I also here. was like, I don't understand what year this is when Cheneys are popping up right and left, and we can't can't drown them in the bathtub. I don't know if that's a Secret Service worthy comment or not, but yeah, we're going back to all the 2000s hits. You know, Cheneys, Bushes, Spider Man, Batman. I mean, like, I know I was annoyed by mainstream liberalism during the Bush years. But I do have the nostalgia glasses about when everybody hated George W. Bush and the people who didn't were so self-evidently terrible, you know? Yeah. They were the ones triggered by the Dixie Chicks. They were the ones who hated gay people. And I mean, 
The only th- the only thing that George W. Bush was a little less shitty on was immigration, which is also baffling. So I guess this shit was always confusing. I just looking back, I'm like in high mm-hmm. school we were all rocking against Bush, darn it, and now I don't know what to do. Yeah, um, I feel the need to challenge the Bush was. I mean, what do you mean? Le- I mean, the uh, ICE was established. You're right. You're under right. Bush, so it's hard to. <laughs> Maybe in his rhetoric, uh, you know, he was better on immigration than Donald Trump, but that's not saying much necessarily. So, I, I mean, even there, liberals are... You are, uh, again, again, you are you are mostly correct. Um, and the ICE thing, of course. Um, but, I mean, we already had a Border Patrol. We just yes. had a nice DHS hat to encompass it all. Yeah. But I see... I, I'm, I'm, I think Bush wanted, like, to get sort... Like, tried to get sort of a, a legal immigration worker thing going he didn't have a stephen miller whispering in his ear um but you're right about rhetoric because i continue to argue that george w bush was um was still bad worse than trump but the rhetoric the rhetoric was just a, it was like a lateral move where it's like oh yeah he makes the government seem stupid and incompetent which it is he just doesn't have that wonk cover to it I think it's like should be wildly uncontroversial that George W. Bush was a far worse president than Donald Trump. Oh, dude, nobody thinks that anymore. Like nobody, <laughs> including very smart people. Get me on the phone friends. with nobody because I will. I will need to convince them that. I mean, that's to ridiculous. Me, to me, Trump was kind of a monkey's paw. Like I wish there'd be a, a president that was so dumb and vulgar and just unpleasant that like the, the the dignity of the presidential office was just sullied forever and somehow that would and then we i mean we got that and all it did was like well now you have elected officials tweeting like cry more libs when they're arrested yeah, when they're elected anything i mean it was just a lateral I mean, move towards towards like open rudeness and prejudice as opposed to wonky like no yeah it, authoritarianism um, yeah, I think. I mean, he didn't sell anything. If there, if there was ever the the the, uh, you know, what was the silver lining there? Well, maybe the libertarian silver lining was that it would sell him the the status of the presidency. I don't think that panned out. I mean, right? It was a one off. Anything more revered because people are like, oh, well, finally we don't have Donald Trump in office. We have like a real exactly. Man, like, like I don't know. Like it's just that didn't work out for for. But I think it's ins- I think it's like completely ridiculous to say. I mean, so much of the of the of the the war on terror, the 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 whole surveillance uh, security state, uh, the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know, under Bush, uh, what what did Trump do that could possibly compare? I mean, yeah, he was awful, awful on immigration. He he increased drone strikes in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere to like loathsome degrees with low with loathsome amounts of civilian casualties. But I don't think that compares to the casualties in Iraq. No, I mean, I think Bush, you can't, you can't beat him. He's just. I think he's one of the maybe top five worst in history. Like those, like terrible wars, terrible additions to the entire, the entire yeah. blue state. Uh, and like it's, I don't know. I, I, and it was like the gay marriage stuff. Is, that se- that just seems like a thousand years ago to people yeah. because like the right now pretends they don't care about gay people they they've switched to there's to an demon- element of that they switched to demonizing trans people absolutely and yeah. demonizing slash rescuing like trans children and stuff but like yeah i really hope that that goes by the wayside like the the gay marriage issue and what we saw in the 2000s looks now kind of like a like a last ditch effort of like intense like homophobia because it felt like the tide was ultimately turning against them and i hope that is kind of what's happening. It's really hard to be that kind of optimistic with a lot of the trans bills uh, in many states, but, but yeah, I, that would be nice. Uh, that would be nice. Um, and and the, the simple visibility of, of trans people, like I'm sure that's not always great or safe for them, but just the fact that they're, they're here and, and you know, the handful of people that are like, but I don't want them to exist. I mean, they lost, you know, because they were always here, and they're just a little more like, hi, now. The bum's lost. <laughs> but, yeah, the state, it's, it's 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 always easier to for me to ignore states passing a horrible law. And the, the trans thing, there's a lot of creeping, just, 
the Texas thing, I always hope the last two horrible things Texas has been up to, I hope will uh, be overturned, but yeah, yeah, you can, you can never count on that. Yeah. Federalism has not looked that good. The last few no. years. It's, it's like, I don't know if that voting with your feet, there's developing <laughs> many great, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe that's unfair because with, with other issues like, um, like legalization of weed. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's true. Huge, that's the federalism that's success story. Victory for mm-hmm. federalism. But on other things, no. Yeah, that's that's the one. I, I'm trying to think of another one. That's the one. I mean, gay marriage, it started that way, actually. And oh, then, yes, yes. That's, um, fair. that's fair. We just haven't had that uh, that that final victory for the weed thing. Maybe maybe one day. Though people, people started celebrating that in 2012, and it was very early to be like, well, no one cares about weed now, guys. Yeah, it's been it's a slow. Well, I heard I didn't didn't Biden promise that. I think when he gets in office, he'll probably he'll, surely he'll follow what he <laughs> when he whenever he gets in there and has the power to change that. I'm sure he'll. I do find myself occasionally reassuring my less like my semi conservative or other uh, relatives that like no one no, nobody likes Biden and no nobody loves Biden. I tons of my friends voted for Biden and they did so with just the most. I don't condone it, but they were very reluctant and very just like... Ugh. Oh, I knew people like that too. Yeah, I mean, that was literally most of my friends just did, like reluctantly voted for Joe Biden, so... Yeah, yeah, know. me too. And that, and, and that group includes, you know, everyone from from well-meaning anarchists to people who like are like Bernie Sanders supporters. You know? Right. The vote for Biden for both of them was very reluctant, kind of uh, trying to be like this harm reduction thing. Yeah. Uh, insofar as that can be applied to voting but do you ever vote i don't i don't know i don't know if we've discussed this i've never voted um i would say maybe biden was the closest be, um like okay so like i mean i mean this is a couple years ago now but you know what was like the worst case scenario on our minds in like 2019 like the worst case scenario could have been like really bad with like trump and like this kind of like cultish following mm-hmm. and this violent rhetoric and this kind of violation of norms and and worrisome about the transfer about the peaceful transfer of power so like i think the very best case for um is like for voting for biden there is kind of like and again without necessarily engaging in like like too much hyperbole but like you know uh, like in what 33 like would you want to be able to say if you lived in germany that you cast a vote against hitler like not that it would change it but like like what would you want to say you have done years from now like morally would you want to say you were just like sitting on the sidelines when there was like at least a vote to stop someone who who ended up being terrible so i ended up not voting but that to me was like the best i I don't know what about you i would have been really upset if you had voted for joe biden like fully like you personally i would have been upset if you were on like on the tally of people who were like ah no i i can't bring myself to to vote i mean one it's it's a hassle um it's very annoying. I don't like <laughs> to be to have to go somewhere, and I guess I could have mailed it in, but that's a lot of paperwork. They don't make <laughs> it um, easy. But but I wasn't fully convinced, and I I would just rather I don't think um, legitimizing the electoral process is worth it. What about? But what, I'm curious. I was going to ask you before you asked me <laughs> if you ever voted. I. Uh, that was my first vote for an actual person with a name, and I, I voted for Joe Jorgensen. Um, oh, to this last election, yeah, I did. Your first vote at first, oh, for like a candidate, and and you voted for Joe. Yeah, Jorgensen. So that was the Libertarian Party candidate. That kind of no, no offense uh, to her, who she seems pretty okay, but like nobody was happy with that. I think, but and the weirder thing is, I think I was swayed to finally do it because of a fucking campaign ad. She had an ad. Wow about ending wars just like a whole general like let's do this let's bring everybody home and let's stop going to war i was like all right joe let's do it wow but the two bonuses were i could say i voted for joe without the e um and also that i got to be morally superior because i voted for a woman uh, oh ticket so i i i'm the true yas queen feminist um that's never been a doubt for me but um (laughs) But wow, you're kind of a sheeple, though, don't you think? You you fell for a for a campaign. Yeah, ad that actually. I mean, it, that everyone. Yeah, you, you sheeple. You yeah, say. that was pretty funny. Um, I'm okay. I mean, and like, I almost over like freaked out about it. Like, voting for the LP is probably 
if I had been old enough in 2004, I totally would have voted for Michael Badnerick, Mr. I don't need a seatbelt. The, the government's trying to put my seatbelt on. Like um, I don't even know that name. Exactly. I don't know where the hell he went. Um, was that the LP candidate? Yeah. Oh. He, he was like a... I don't even remember how weird he actually was, but he had kind of weirdo vibes. Like, he was he was mad about seatbelts. Wow, he was yeah, the seat- LP candidate and he had weirdo vibes? <laughs> I'm not sure I believe you. Well, Joe Jorgensen, um, I don't have any strong opinions about her, but... Kind of no just, one does. I mean, some people were mad, but, like... About you voting for Joe Jorgensen? No, just about her very oh, existence. Oh, Joe Jorgensen. Nobody, okay. I don't know if you were kind of being intimidated, I mean, <laughs> you know, at the, at the booth by any... Statists. <laughs> well, there were statists surrounding me, as, as usual, who, as, we, as they're always are. People really concerned that Joe Jorgensen was going to win the election. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have voted twice if I was of age. I in, And this is really embarrassing. But in 2008, I would have voted for John McCain. Oh, yeah. I remember. I think we've just talk, discussed yeah, we've, this a little bit. Talk about this That's sure. super weird, though. Um, of all, like, Why? Well, I mean, we could get into like our, like the whole how I got like I mean, I was only thirteen, right. but I was into politics. I followed the news. I um, I read about stuff, and um, I guess I was just kind of a generic. Like I was never religious or socially conservative, but um, my initial inclinations were kind of towards you know something like limited government and mm-hmm. well, uh, the people on Fox News are telling me that. Barack Obama does not want limited government. He wants well, communism. he doesn't. They were right about that. <laughs> well, okay, but neither did John McCain. In hindsight, <laughs> yeah, you know, I absolutely right about that. prefer. I'm absolutely. I think Obama winning was better than John McCain for sure. Maybe um, so, yeah. But but also, I would have voted by the time 2012 came around. I was still not old enough to vote, but I totally would have voted for Ron Paul, which is less embarrassing than McCain. Sure. That, a lot, that uh, he, you know, that was like a lot of good anti-war stuff, anti-war on drug stuff. Um, I have a weird relationship with Ron Paul, but uh, <laughs> not that I've all ever met him. I say that like as a like, well, yeah, we're, we're like <laughs> we all have. A, if we don't have a weird relationship with Ron Paul, are you really libertarian or anarchist? I don't know. Do a lot of the people I know, even you know, that are like me, like full-on real left market anarchists now, and really have a long list of things to dislike about Ron Paul. Even even my friends like that, um, a lot of them were brought in with his kind of, you know, because they were into politics and then he was kind of that avenue into something more radical, something more anti-war. Um, so, uh, but There are major problems with Ron Paul, but the fact that America had a fit of peak and elected Donald Trump for, like, sassing, you know, the swamp and occasionally sassing, well, yeah. like, Dick Cheney, like, and that that's the what they went election. with. I guess by the time that came around, I was firmly, it was pretty much, I mean, 2012 is like literally when I, I think when I actually read stuff about anarchism and like became an anarchist. And mm-hmm. by the, surely by the time the next election came around, I was like, well, voting is not, uh, not, a great, not a great track record. So I'm not interested in that anymore. I voted um, none of the above in 2008. I wrote in none of the above. Um Oh, nice. And well, I why did you vote for the LP candidate that year? Who was the LP candidate that year? I don't even know. Oh, dude, it was Bob Barr. Uh, now, if you have any memory of Bob Barr, that's oh, okay. he was Vaguely. the most tepid. He was like the boring... I'm trying to think of a comparison to him. He was just... He was very moderate, but on everything, kind of, for a libertarian. And he just... For a libertarian. He was not like I, I gotta look him up later to refresh myself why I couldn't vote for him. But uh, mm. and then Gary Johnson, I like didn't even go to the polls at all. And I told him once I was like Gary Johnson, I was thinking about voting for you, but uh, you I did. You said I what? Well, wait, what did you say? Why did did you give him um, a reason? He was being he was being kind of half. This was actually that was twenty twelve. He was being half asked about drone stuff. I don't and, remember that. Whoa, what? I remember liking Gary Johnson well enough back then. I really liked when he didn't know um, what Aleppo was. You know what? That I was that. Kind of, yeah, like, that you know what? So my favorite politician moment in ever. <laughs> the thing about him is, and then again, plenty of faults, plenty of problems, but like the fact that he didn't just do some asshole slick move and genuinely was like, wait, what? Because it was, it was very out of context. It was very yeah. abrupt. They didn't say Syria. 
Um, yeah. And it just, it was kind of, it was a strangely pure moment that doesn't Very prove endearing. that he's like a drooling moron. And like, I get why well, people made that a thing, but it was a little too much of a thing, honestly. Nah. I don't know. If, if an American president, uh, like, knows like exactly where Al- that like Alpo is and knows all about it. Like chances are it's because they want to bomb. I mean, that's it. true. That's and true. Gary Johnson just being like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like not know like that's. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I mean, do you think George W. Bush knew where it was back when he was bombing other countries? Like sometimes they don't even know where it is. Uh, they I just mean, know it's got to get we're bombed. Pretty fast. It's not like the president is pushing the buttons to, to the to a point on the map. <laughs> yeah. You know, from his like lair. But well, the extent to which George W. Bush was like uh, conventionally intelligent or not is—I mean—I think that's kind of debated. debatable. Yeah. Um, don't have any strong opinions on that. No, it's hard to tell because doesn't uh, matter. Sometimes it's I don't terrible. talk real good, but I ain't dumb or nothing. Yeah, um, same. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Gary, okay, so Gary Johnson, it was in D.C. He was having a little yay me rally. I went there. I was like, Gary, I have some problems with you and drone strikes. I'm thinking about voting for none of the above instead. And he said, I'm better looking than none of the above. Which I, <laughs> I, And I was like, you know what? Not bad. I, I, I have a little soft spot for politicians who are actual humans and i think he is one so that's uh i feel like we're i was like praising his like not knowing international affairs you're praising his actual human thing i feel like this is how we well, he's like quip. Trump. he like it was just a dumb quip but it was just kind of funny I'm worried like, this is like the mentality like yeah i'm sure donald trump didn't know where alipo was like look what that got us like i don't know I, mean, I guess i guess my position is like it's like donald trump probably not knowing where alipo was was like one of the least bad things about him you know right <laughs> The idea that the naked narcissism, as opposed to the the, the veiled narcissism of, of of Trump, like the of, of politicians, like as if that was likely to ever get us like any individualist wins, is very weird to think. I like about. that description: the naked narcissism versus the veiled. That's an accurate description, and that's probably why a lot of people like him for sure. I mean, that's what people say they like his kind of authenticity. But it's like the authenticity of a total scumbag narcissist. Who, uh, for sure, for sure. Who's never read a book in his life? I mean, you don't have this. Oh, like okay, Obama's like your condescending but kind of friendly college professor. Like you might, you know, he's not like he's read a bunch of books, obviously, and stuff. Like people, the liberal mainstream who believes that just the right smarty pants nice guy can make it all work. Yeah, I get yeah, why. I mean, okay, I think we should do away with voting completely and just decide the president by how many books they've read like <laughs> count up to how many books they've read in each of them and then well there's your new president mm. whoever has the highest stack and well, then I mean, we would have avoided trump that way we, d- we definitely would avoid trump that day i don't know who like who in government right now would win that well hillary, just... hillary clinton would have won instead of trump <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure that's true it's not based on what based on trump it's not sometimes it's not clear to me if clinton would have been better um what I find amazing is that the choices in 2020 were actually worse than the choices in 2016. Yeah, and the, the choices in 2016 were so bad, and they actually were yeah. worse. Yeah, it's sure. shocking. And nobody was happy that time. I mean, Hillary Clinton has always had more fans than Joe Biden ever will, I think. Because yeah, but more like, haters. Right. I mean, and often for actual, like, weird, vaguely well, sexist... Well, nonsense reasons. Yeah. Which is weird because she's a horrible hawk. She has a lot of things that I think right. Republicans should love her for. <laughs> oh, for <laughs> sure. Republicans of old, at least, of the earlier aughts, you know. Oh, for sure. Very weird. Um, we had a vibe, like we had, we had a thing going there. But when you were talking about norms before and uh, uh, peaceful transfers of power, I haven't really talked to you at all about like. January 6th shenanigans and like that kind of just the way that everybody reacted to that and like how as anarchists how unsettled in any one direction we should be about like both that occurring and the aftermath and stuff because I got a lot of extremes on that and I don't feel particularly extreme about it in a lot of ways what happened on January 6th um a peaceful um republican so, party i guess that's a good question and and it even still still feels we're talking about um a couple years later because of 
ongoing electoral issues. But yeah, that's another one where it's hard to be nuanced on. I think anarchists underrate um, the peaceful transfer of power um, a little bit. And that might be true, yeah. Kind of the the, the liberal norms um, and processes that that come along with that. And that was that was always, I think, Trump's greatest threat. It was not necessarily on the substance of policy, even though he was terrible on so many policies. But it was often on, on kind of a meta level beyond policy of these questions of processes and procedures and, and, and the idea of and, and, and it's annoying to me that anarchists underrate these things because I think it's very I mean, one, I think it shows why anarchists should in some sense be really liberal, although mm-hmm, sure. I think liberals should be anarchists. And I think liberals end up overrating the peaceful transfer of power and these sure. norms and stuff because they just want to keep it around forever and think that that's good enough. Um, but the idea to me that a government unconstrained by the peaceful transfer of power and these norms would be better or more just in any way is wildly uh, re- like just I just cannot wrap my head around that. So I think protecting these norms is is perfectly uh, good and, and in line, at least with having norms that in some way constrain government power. I mean, if they if they do it at all, but. There's no, I mean, it's hard to imagine how it could be better without them, obviously. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just I mean, like, just like the constitution is so both, I mean, it's not working to limit things and it allows for too many things and all that. But if it was gone, I mean, I, I we'd be worse off in yeah, certain well, ways. I mean, I like the first amendment. I can't help it. I'm a, well, the amount, the plenty of amendments protect great, uh, genuine liberties. I mean, the question of like what I mean, it, it's like, what do you mean? Are, are you talking about we just get rid of the Constitution today, or like we never had the Constitution? Or, I think more or, like we're gonna re, we're gonna write, we're just gonna start from scratch. We're gonna rewrite the whole thing. Just I mean, today we would come up with probably a worse Constitution. I think we absolutely would a worse state. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think opposition to the Constitution can be grounded in like that kind of like hokey vision of us just like writing something better like now. Like no, that seems unlikely. Um, especially given our, our uh, amendments to it over the years. Right. Um, and expanding uh, equal rights and stuff, um, like rights to property and things. So, yeah. Um, but even it's, it's not even like just like specifically the peaceful transfer of power is. And it's weird that, that folks like, I mean, uh, Rothbard could have had moments where he underrated liberal norms. But um, even even he spoke very positively um, in places of the peaceful transfer of power and how useful the democratic constraints on government introduced in the 17th and 18th centuries were, were useful in making them uh, less bad. And, mm-hmm. and, and this goes even more so for someone like Mises, who himself may overrate these things because he doesn't abandon the state altogether. But he also talks extensively about the especially the peaceful transfer of power and how that is like itself like maybe the key underpinning all of this stuff with like avoiding autocratic rule um, and giving and giving some semblance of, of turning over the power to another person is like fairly, fairly essential in constraining government. I mean, I, I almost feel like in, in this one area, being a moderate makes the most sense because to me, you get people like, I'm just going to name drop someone like Jordan Peterson who people pretend is in the classical liberal tradition, and I don't think he particularly yeah. is. At least, in my, I don't I'm not a fan. I don't like him in most areas. And my sort of straw version of him is that he thinks that if you, you know, if too many young people start picking their own pronouns, like Western civilization will crumble. Like to me, that's the ultimate conservative, where any kind of change in yeah. the norms of how we speak, sort of like it's it's all going to just it can't stand up to that. Yeah. But then you also have people who are a little too confident that is if we just get start revolting, we're just gonna like maybe for great reasons, like we're gonna fix it all. And oh. I mean I was just like I was just reading literally just, just Wikipedia but about the French Revolution and the the um the Haitian Revolution. Yeah. And both of those justifiable, you know, overthrowing the Haitian one of course more than anything. Um but both of those I would say yeah. are justified and they had so much bloodshed and so many casualties and just sadistic sort of cruelties in the most justified conflicts you could think of. The Haiti one is one of the most justified things you could think of. And just, I agree. 
I mean, I think I'm a little timid, maybe. Like, I like my comfortable life. I don't want, you know, society being massive, massive upheaval is not going to be comfy for anybody. But realistically, I just remain pretty skeptical that these things tend to lead to anything besides just bloodbaths. I don't know. So this, so that, I think that's a really good question. I think there are two problems here, or two questions, because, I mean, were you talking about this in the context of January 6th? So one is, was that on January 6th, um, the protests and then and then the attack on um, on the Capitol building, was that uh, in any way some sort of anarchist revolt? And I think, <laughs> no. well, yeah, no. It, weirdly, I feel like a, a lot of people try to like mangle it and twist it into some way of like counting as that. Mm-hmm. But that's obviously ridiculous. It was not... Really, strictly speaking, it wasn't pro or anti-government as such. It was just pro Donald Trump led government and anti Biden right. government. It was just trying to stop the peaceful transfer of power, like that. It was anti peace. It wasn't anti government. It was just anti peaceful transfer of power. And if you really think the peaceful transfer of power is a useful limit on government, however imperfect, then that's that doesn't seem um, helpful. No. The second question is: Would a hypothetical genuine anarchist revolution um be desirable and if that's what we're talking about here like in the sense of revolution in the sense of like some sort of organized violent um overthrow i mean yeah i don't i'm definitely anti-revolution in that sense um yeah i don't really see any like viable prospect of social change coming out of that um, I think surely that would, in many cases, unleash a worse government to take its place. Um, um, so, so it's hard for me. I mean, in a, in a way, I think that stuff is just as idealistic, if not more, than hoping for a lot of hoping for viable social change and reform, reform and revolution. I think no, it, I, I think you're right. I don't. Yeah, I don't see the. I don't see hope in either of those. I think something more gradual and grassroots and bottom up, um, you know, changing culture, changing the norms, changing um, institutions, creating new institutions and slowly changing society that way is in many ways, the only ways it ever really changes, um, even though we have these violent hiccups. Um, At least the only substantial, I mean, again, I think of like, yeah, the end in, in Haiti, like eventually you didn't have slavery. You had, pretty horrible um plantation work for kind of crappy wages still you had all sorts of bad stuff too but like i always get conflicted about you know it's easy to say this when i again i'm not in some i'm not in prison i'm not in some worse situation whatever equivalent we might have now but you still have to ignore again the bloodshed the sort of outbursts of violence that aren't conveniently directed at you know yeah. The worst people, the, the only the people who might actually deserve it, whatever that means from a yeah. near pacifist, almost pacifist perspective. Well, well I think the, I see, I, I, I'm definitely no expert in the Haitian Revolution. My kind of surface level understanding of the Haitian Revolution is that it was perhaps the most justified revolution. And it seems like if they replaced slavery with something that was, while heinous, if it was better than slavery, then that seems like an improvement to me. I... I can't speak to to the broader conditions um, of that revolution and the change, but but I mean, I just it doesn't seem to me like it's not ruled out in like inherently, but it's like like that is not like in any way like a, like like un, like a viable like you're not changing the culture, you're not changing the norms, you're not changing uh, um, what people think is right and wrong. So I don't see how how that or at least that alone can bring about any sustainable change. In most cases, you're just going to. I think, like, if we were to overthrow the United States government, what, I mean, are you telling me a new government wouldn't come into its place? I mean, it's not like everyone in the geographic area of the United States would suddenly have my views on politics. I mean, you can sort of use a half-assed version of that argument with anybody who argues an anarchist point at all. Well, you know, a big other big bad state or warlord comes in and takes over, so what the hell was the point? But that's also sort of, that's very, the most self-defeating Argument. Yeah, I think I think there are two things with that. I think that's a I think that's a related but slightly different issue because that's kind of like 
okay, like regardless of how anarchism and anarchist society might come about, it's like, wouldn't anarchist society in a certain geographical area be like really prone to um, like some sort of military invasion? And that's, and, and I think there are decent arguments on both sides of that. I think, um, I think one, it's a reason obviously to view anarchism as scale independent Mm -hmm. and say, obviously the goal isn't just, you know, overthrow one government of one area, but it's, you know, to have no governments um, globally. Um, And also, I mean, yeah, you would, might be more, um, you went face invasion, like more than your average actual regular state. But that's a tiny bit like saying, well, if you're not a violent person, people are going to be violent to you. Okay, therefore what? I should be a more violent person? I mean, it doesn't translate oh. to the scale of an entire geographical area, but, and, you know, somebody somebody might exploit you isn't really as... Or somebody might hurt you is not really an argument, you know. It's not, it's not, oh, it's not a very substantial... Yes. It's just doing their work for them. It's like, okay, you're afraid right. the situation will devolve into a state, therefore we should have a state at, to begin with. And... And that's how you get minarchists. Well, actually, you get a lot worse than minarchists under that. But oh, yeah. Also... But, um, but I, even I, even on the, see, I think it's interesting when, when there, if, if, if a geographic area has no regime to change, I think it is often more costly to invade and conquer than just to invade and regime change. If anything, we could think that's the lesson from the United States occupying Afghanistan for 20 years. Sure. And accomplishing nothing. And, Same as in Russia before that. I mean, yes. Uh, so I, th- I think that um, I think there's some good arguments to think that really so having, decentralization is protection instead. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, it makes it more because then you have to set up the regime. That's an that's another enormous cost. It's not impossible. It's not. Um, it's it's happened before in history. But like in terms of just comparing the the trade offs, I think I think that's also relevant. People never learn that you're not going to win these conflicts where you have to reshape an entire area. Like you will, all you do is waste 15 years and right. a few thousand of your pe- people and a few hundred thousand of theirs. Um, but you know, yes. we are a little slow on the uptake there. Not you and I, we're perfect, flawless, enlightened beings. I've, I've never made a mistake in my life. And you, I know. I've never seen you make a mistake in your life. I, absolutely. Um, should I ask you about the new Batman movie, even though I haven't seen it yet? Um, Give me no, a no, thesis of anarchism and bat and the Batman movie in five five minutes. Go. No, I don't know. How was it? Oh, I like the new Batman movie. Um, but you haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Well, I'm an enjoyer of Batman things. And um, I enjoyed that movie. It's nice um, in terms of, um, I guess, movie industry. It's nice to see a little more of a filmmaker-driven movie that looks to be very successful. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll continue um, giving filmmakers some more freedom and making superhero movies are, are the worst when it comes to that. Um, as much as sure. I like them, uh, so many of them um, have become the worst when it comes to that rote um, studio style. Is there any philosophy you can squeeze out of the new Batman that, like, because people, you know, people call it like, the Nolan ones, sort of fash, fash e, if not. Oh fascist. yeah. Well, I don't think the Nolan ones are. I mean, there are a couple ways. I think maybe a little. They're, they're. I think strictly speaking, they're really neoconservative. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, he he sees Batman as like this last ditch effort against these. Uh, all his villains are essentially unsympathetic, anti civilization, uh, terrorists. Really, all of them, in every movie, and Batman is the only the last resort for liberalism that now has to fight. That explains why all the villains are a million times more interesting than Batman is, particularly in those movies. I mean, um, I mean, oh, I like, I mean, some of my favorite villains are in the Tim Burton movies. I mean, that's one thing about this new movie. That's nice. If you're a Batman fan, this is one of, this, I is, am. this is, Oh, well, good. This is the <laughs> one where I, I think really uh, the villains in no way over while being great in the, in their own right, in no way overshadow, Batman. It's his own movie. He's really the main character. You really get inside his head. He's on screen a lot. You don't have to see his parents get killed, right? Like as much as you can for the um, 39th reboot in 10 years. You they don't tread water. They don't retread where where we've seen in all the old movies. I mean that alone makes me more interested in seeing it because I love Batman, but I wasn't like you know particularly excited about another one. You know, kind of. Yeah, I wasn't at first either. Um, 
especially because at first I thought it looked a little derivative of the Nolan stuff and like too, sure yeah it looked That's... too much emphasis on like and and the Nolan ones I like less and less in part because their like conception of Batman is more of this like really like hyper masculine hyper violent guy with like an anger problem who's constantly yelling um I've actually really enjoyed watching not watching but like seeing your changing perspective on those nolan batman because we've talked about this over the, like many years at this about point. years i used to love them i used to love them but yeah I, I i i whenever i return to them it's been a little while now but other things stand out to me as as frustrating and annoying when i and and, and, and largely it's the depiction of batman i think they're I think they have big ideas on their mind. They're philosophical. Mm-hmm. I think they're political. That's interesting. But like its depiction of Batman is um, not necessarily uh, what I want. And this and this movie is in many ways an answer to that because it's kind of, um, you know, again, without spoiling anything, but but it's definitely kind of saying like Batman is is not um, that's not all Batman is. And he can grow to be more than just this uh, vengeance machine, you know, beating up people. Um, well, the reason that I my my favorite Batman is the Kevin Conroy cartoon yeah, Batman, me too. and I always think of I mean he still has this sort of paranoid, mistrusting nature, but in episodes like I'm thinking of two, one where Poison Ivy is supposedly reformed and he's like suspicious of it, but if she truly had been, you know, I feel like that that Batman would have let it go. That Batman kind of would have been okay with rehabilitation. Or like the episode where Harley Quinn has like a screwball adventure. She gets released from Arkham. Oh, I love that episode. And I know. And at the end of it, he gives her the dress that she accidentally shoplifted, st- setting off the whole wacky yeah, train of yeah. events and stuff. And just sort of like that Batman in particular has a lot of that, humanity towards these cartoon, cartoony cartoon characters. That the Batman is the best Batman. It's not really close. It's not close. I know. Uh, both the voice actor Kevin Conroy and the show and, and everything of the aesthetic of the show and the stories of the show. I think that's my main my main point of view as well. That show has a great that episode has a great moment where they Harley and him are talking at the end and and, and Harley says something about having a bad day and Batman's like, Yeah, you know what? I had a bad I know. day. And it's like, oh my tears. Like I Yeah, know. it's just that's the Batman. I, I think the Nolan ones get it wrong. You can see it all in the first movie because um, you know, I think Batman he's supposed to, you know, he sees himself as kind of fallen. And so, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't see himself as beyond redemption and he treats even his worst villains that same way, or he, he strives to, you know, he doesn't want to see anyone as beyond redemption. And, um, that's very valuable for him. And the Nolan movies, just look at the, the, the actual moral lesson in Batman begins. He saves Roz as pronounced in that movie. Uh, and at the end of the first act, I'm like falling off the cliff or something. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, his the big triumphant moment is Batman saying, "Well, I don't have to save you." It's I, very I, odd. That was always my least like, favorite. Wait a minute. <laughs> you don't have to save him. What? That's not what. Like that's not what hero usually does. Like, are you kidding me? That's that's what this movie's about. Yeah, th- that is a note of triumph. Is bizarre if you think I, about I, it. People don't say like it's just that goes. Oh, I used to like try i used to like yeah they used to bother me less um but more and more it's like no that's the moral <laughs> point of this movie and it's very strange and it's not what i associate with batman and this movie is a total repudiation of that this movie the new one is all about redemption in many ways it's i it's like okay the Batman movie in terms of emphasizing that kind of theme which is great and refreshing that um yeah you, you've sold me on at least taking a look at that um oh for sure i want to hear what you think when you see it on the new one Batman was always my favorite. I got a little more into Superman and, and into hating Zack Snyder's portrayal of Superman. Oh, um, yeah, I love hating Zack Snyder's portrayal. <laughs> really, including especially Superman. Super, Superman is the only superhero that I like the best in comic form, but I did become sort of a... All right, well, okay, who's the, who's your most anarchist, let's see, let's see, like, mainstreamish superhero, not an obscure, like... <laughs> Politics and superheroes is tough. I mean, I think there are anarchist elements to Batman in some of his mm-hmm. stories. There are there are very non-anarchist elements as well, but there are also anarchist elements. He he he. Um, you know, I mean, I've never, even from when I was little, you know, I I I was never for once thought you know law and morality were the same thing. Well, you were a good little lad then. And, and yeah, and, and and surely in part that's because I was constantly watching depictions of a character who is shown to be justified in in protecting somebody, even though he was operating outside the law and he wasn't a cop, even if he had to fight cops to do it. 
he would do it. I mean, that's we actually almost underrate that as a message within a lot of superhero media because we people are just like, oh, they're just a vigilante, which obviously has its downsides in reality. But just like the the message that the law, like operating outside of the law, isn't bad necessarily. That's yeah. like I never really thought what I one of the most important lessons you could in part like brainwash a child into realizing because that's because every you know everyone on uh, most children have parents that will tell them the opposite like explicitly yeah. to bring it like full circle like, like there's an element of fetishizing uh process and and uh, uh norms here with thinking that you know only police officers can enact justice they have some monopoly like inherently on and they're magic justice. i mean that's what it is. It's like, it's, 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 it's this, that's where you go too far, I think. And it's like, you're what's, but what's, what's operating is like a very strange, like worldview in which only police um, can, can rightfully protect people and then rightfully be heroes. I mean, that's, it makes no sense. And, and blind to the institutional problems of policing. Except on January 6th, when I guess they're the villains of the piece. But, um, I, I declare it all wrapped up with saying you got to have both good principles and you have to realize how they work in the real world because sure. everybody who ever wanted to liberate a country, you know, be a bombs and shit. Yeah. Like, like I'd rather live under George W. Bush than Saddam Hussein. I imagine, which is an right. unpleasant sentence, but like, did we, did, did they fix it over there with, with their principles of f- vague principles of freedom? No. I right. mean, or the, the principle that, you know, any kind of state is authoritarian and unjust, it's a good principle. But if I go blow up, <laughs> you know, the, the entire capital, whatever, have I fixed that? Yeah. And there are, and there are degrees of injustice. I would rather. Sure. Absolutely. I would rather live under Biden than Putin. And I, and I assume. Me too. <laughs> uh, Zelensky than Putin. And I'm sure many people feel that way as well. Uh, so it's just. It's it's it is hard to shut out the line. I'm just I'm wildly against uh, the United States and 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 and, and NATO uh, directly intervening into this. And I and I've been pleased by Biden and NATO repeatedly saying that there's not going to be a no-fly zone. That's very uh, uh, very good to hear that. Um, I but it's hard to shut out the line between consistently opposing that and 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 understanding that well the people in Ukraine have every have every right to defend against like people attacking their house with bombs and guns that work for the Russian military. That's absolutely. And even like rhetorically, it bothers me to not understand the basic concept of we were over here and then a big ass army came here. I mean, yeah. it almost doesn't matter no, to you... a point who, who's, who's believing what in that circumstances, because again, Iraq, no. Do we love like you know various insurgents who are fighting U.S. troops? Probably not. Would we rather live right. you know amongst the U.S. troops and their more liberal, right. kind of more liberal norms? Yeah, but like, the, of course they were doing that. I mean, of course. Or um, you know, yeah. Southerners um, during the Civil War, like not some plantation or random Southern farmer guy being like, oh no, a bunch yeah. of armies are here. I right. feel a little violated. Yeah, it's easy. Easy to lose sight of the micro interactions that you know when we're talking on such a large scale. Oh, it's just just more on that topic because I think, um, like people conflate like like explanation and justification a lot in this kind of discussion. Indeed. And like I think like the realist explanations about you know what's going on is you know our geopolitical rivals competing over 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 geographic areas and states that they, they want control over for obvious reasons. And it, and it's perfectly valid to talk about NATO doing something bad or NATO expanding and how, um, like Putin thinks it's in his, you know, uh, geopolitical interests to make sure right. control over Ukraine or parts of Ukraine. And he's willing, but like, that's wildly different than, and if people on both sides, I feel like conflate this, like people that are like explaining that run it, then run into like the justifications, like, whoa, wait, that's, it's still an invasion. It's still obvious violence by a, an enormous authoritarian military against innocent people who aren't doing anything to them. Um, so like, how could you ever conflate, like, like it, you don't need to, to let the, the rightful points about 
about um, NATO expansion get into uh, justifying what Putin's doing. I mean, unfortunately, it just seems, you know, many states in that area, a lot of the Baltic states, the former Soviet blocs, they're caught in a trap here. They, they, a lot of them now obviously do want NATO protection because, for sure. obviously, because of Russian aggression against them and military invasion. So it's strange to understand that element of it. But it's just two, it feels like two empires, you know, with a state's caught in the middle and they want, they have to pick one side or the other to feel protected. That's literally the Cold War, of course. I mean, that's exactly Oh, yeah, of what course. This is what, <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, Putin is operating with the Cold War mentality. I really hope that it does not, the century is not ex- like a, an exact uh, repeat of the last. That would be unpleasant, it's but. An uninspired sequel to the 20th century. Very. The, the reboot that we all regretted. <laughs> I hate reboots, man, most oh. of the time. Man, except the new Batman. Oh, I mean, the, fair, fair enough. Yeah, fair. Even though you haven't, yeah. I do feel like it all it keeps going back to, and I feel like I've cited Ron Paul more in this conversation than I have in like the past like uh-huh. six years. But um, he is sort he was sort of an inroad for a lot of people in different directions, and like it, it keeps going back to Ron Paul versus Rudy Giuliani, two thousand eight, where Rudy Giuliani thinks oh, yeah. that talking about blowback means you're justifying nine eleven. Right. Yeah. And I feel like we. I, we didn't get that far from that argument still no. because I'm seeing both. Well, explaining it means you're justifying it. And also you, you, you should justify it if you want to explain it sort of. And right. both of those are, are, are crazy to me. Yeah. You need to separate. Yeah. It's it's, a, it, should, it should be completely disappointing. Separated. Well, um, I guess I should let you go now and, should yeah, you should if... probably release me from your. You kidnapped me for this whole conversation. <laughs> I did. It's been nice of you, just to go I've been talking. To I would never violate. Before. I would never violate uh, such norms. Um, okay. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, Lucy, and um, it was lovely to your... see you again, and to hear. Yes, your... although I don't think our. I think it's just listeners. They're not going to see us, but we're looking at each other. I mean, I see, yeah, yeah. Don't give it away. But I can see your we face right over, now. We just went over the kidnapping. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true. And good luck in your future endeavors, podcasting for non-Servium. I'm a big fan of non-Servium. Um, best yeah, of luck all that stuff. I hope it's very popular. And I hope this one is, uh, is fun to the listeners. Yes. I think, I, I mean, I had it. fun. I don't care about you listeners. Um, I'm looking yeah. forward to doing more uh, interviews with non-Servium. And I'm sure we'll have you on again. Yeah, you could do like a real interview with like a real person instead of just. <laughs> I don't know. Like. We're, we're we're taking it a little easy, and I still think we had some we had some good stuff. We had some good Dude, thoughts. We had, a, some we had big a, galaxy brain takes. Look at us, look at us. Just uh, a couple of <laughs> couple of fearless go getters. <laughs> Amazing! I'm like, incredible. Incredible. Um, where okay, so do you want to like where people the can people... find me? Well, I'm currently kidnapped um, under Lucy's control. If somebody can find me mm-hmm. there and help yeah. me escape, that would be nice. It's in Pennsylvania, but um, that's all you get before, to know. Before you uh, before you do that, definitely follow me on Twitter. That's more. That's I want my followers to go up on Twitter before, even if I'm kidnapped. That's you know <laughs> do that first before freeing me. Um, and my oh my Twitter is at my my name. Is that Corey Massimino? Shockingly, that's easy enough. Um, Yep. I guess lis- listeners can find me at Lucy Stag at uh, the Twitter ad. Um, and the non Servium Media Collective is on a lot of sites, but it's definitely on Twitter at, under non Servium Media, all one word. Um, and you can find it on YouTube and Instagram and far too many other sites. And you should, because it's nifty. You should. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll kidnap you. Yeah, no, no, no. No, 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 no. That's no. not anarchist of course, of course. We won't kidnap you, but we like consensual. you. It's <laughs> consensual. All right, Walter Block. No, come find us. And Corey. Okay. Okay, you bye. Have Walter on non hand. No! <laughs>
helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.